I start explaining um, all collections inspiring new crea creativity, um, the digitalization of cultural heritage collections has been going on the several decades, a uh, promising unprecedented potential for those museums to fulfill its public mission and uh, the opening of knowledge and cultural heritage to full, uh, to full the participation and learning and creativity uh, for uh, leading those questions to speak about this. We have invited to uh, Merete Sanderhoff. Merete, uh, she's a curator and senior advisor at the Statens Museum for Kunst, uh, in, where she has worked uh, for, since 2007. Uh, and she's specialized in opening digitalized collections um, and how inviting to the public to share those uh, heritage. Uh, for us, it's important to have Meret here. Um, Merete, she has a very wide experience and is the ideal person to speak about this openness of museums and white collections. Uh, please, Merete, uh, when you want, uh, I need you uh, to speak and um, to share. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to uh, come and uh, be a part of your conference mm -hmm. here. I've been looking very much forward. Mm -hmm. um, Do you want to share? And I screen? am just going to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to share my screen. Is that okay? Yeah, for, for sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then Great. I leave and leave you here. Thank you so much, Anna. Now I can only see my slides, but I know you're all out there and uh, I've been looking greatly forward to um, speaking with you today um, and to take part in this uh, wonderful Congress of yours. Um, um, Ross already made a fantastic introduction to the whole conference. Um, and what I will try to do is give you some hands on um, examples of practices of building communities based on opening up our collections to inspire new creativity. I'll just hide this icon. A little introduction to who I am and where I'm working from and coming from in my speech. Um, I'm uh, educated as an art historian and I work as curator and senior advisor in the field of digital museum practice. I have a very hands-on approach to cultural heritage and the reuse of it. Um, I believe very strongly in learning through creative reuse uh, because once you are able to, to touch and manipulate the digital copies of uh, art and cultural heritage, it comes closer to you, your own bodies and senses and the cultural heritage means something different when you can touch it. I'm going to show you examples of this in my talk. Um, apart from working at SMK, I also uh, instigated the conference Sharing is Caring 10 years ago. Um, and I've been also very closely affiliated with Europeana for many years, serving as the chair of the Europeana Network for uh, a couple of years and now serving on the advisory board to the Europeana Foundation. So like Ross started out saying, I also believe firmly in collaboration across our sector. This is SMK, Statens Museum for Kunst, the National Gallery of Denmark, where I work. Uh, we hold a collection of Western art from uh, the medieval times to the present day, uh, approximately a quarter of a million artworks. It's a vast collection, very difficult to get a complete overview of. Uh, but one thing we do know is that approximately 66% of the collection is in the public domain, meaning that the artworks are so old that uh, copyright has expired. So I've been working here since 2007 and I took part in developing the museum's first digital strategy in 2009, where we promised ourselves and our users that we want to be 
a catalyst of users' creativity. And the way we've tried to put that into reality is uh, through a five-year project called SMK Open, where we have been working to open up the museum's digitized collections and knowledge for all to use and enjoy. And this project is coming to an end this year. At the heart of SMK Open is our online collection, which you find at open.smk.dk. And I'll show you briefly to get you a sense of what it looks like. But I also invite you to go to our blog, medium.com uh, slash SMK Open, um, to read much more about the technologies and the concepts and the, the ambitions that go into Open SMK. One of the features of uh, our online collection has been to try and make it easy and more fun for everyone to look for art and make discoveries. Um, and one feature is that you can search by color, which is somewhat, something everyone can do, whereas it's difficult for a lot of people to know how to spell a specific uh, artist's name or no, even the inventory number or something. We also uh, have put 3D scans of our sculpture collection um, in the online collection, so you can uh, experience them uh, from many different angles um, and free, freely reuse those that are free of copyright. Um, another feature is that uh, you can um, search for keywords, uh, which are machine generated. Um, in a, a technological sandwich between um, uh, uh, vocabularies and image recognition. You can read more about that in our blog. So you can type in an ordinary word like window and find um, images in the collection that match with that. Approximately 34,000 images and scans uh, are in the public domain in the online collection. Um, so that's a lot less than the 260,000 artworks, but that's because we haven't digitized everything in the collection yet, uh, but we're working on it. And we use the Creative Commons public domain dedication to make it easy and understandable for everyone that you may freely use these images. And here's one example, back to the window search from before, um, a painting by Wilhelm Hammershoek. Uh, it's easy for you to see that you may download it, share it, and use it freely. Um, and it's in big, high resolution. The whole sentiment behind um, opening up the collection in this way is that we realize that as museum people, we don't necessarily get the best ideas how to use the collection. We know how to preserve them and how to study them, but people outside the museum walls have different ideas for what you can do with them. So the Hammershoi painting is one example. Here's a creative remix made by a Finnish um, artist and uh, educator called Kathy Hüppe. Uh, she created a pop up version of this painting for a remix exhibition we did at SMK in 2015 with a motorized light source so that uh, the light would pass through the laser cut window pane um, and sort of bring the painting to life in a playful manner. And we also, for this exhibition, invited the artists who did the remixes to present their thoughts and ideas um, to our big audience at the museum um, and place the remixes right next to the originals. Uh, so to try and bring this um, uh, vision or this ambition of being a catalyst of users' creativity right into the museum gallery. In this whole digital transformation that we are going through as a sector. Um, opening up our collections uh, is one important step to 
uh, help people discover and enjoy and learn with our collections. But it also demands that we step into a new role as facilitators. Um, and this is sort of a, a diagram of how we do that, going from uh, left to right from our online collection with the CC0 um, dedication to the public domain through all the resources we have, through all the platforms you can use those on, through all the projects that come out of it. This process is about democratizing the cultural heritage that we as museums protect, but we protect it on behalf of the public. Um, and digitization enables us to democratize access and reuse in all new ways. At SMK, we have a strategy called SMK for All, um, and I'd like to read a little bit from it for you. Being the National Gallery and Main Art Museum in Denmark, SMK carries an important responsibility towards the entire country and beyond. The vast collection of 700 years of art is common national property, and ideally, everyone who lives in Denmark share a sense of ownership to this unique cultural heritage. And because the internet is worldwide, this ownership is extended to everyone uh, who has access to the internet. Our work is based on the conviction that the artworks in our rich collection has a role to play in the society that surrounds us through its ability to deepen our understanding of the world, its peoples, and histories. We believe that the development museums have undergone in the past decades holds the key to engage far more and more different people than we reach today. And I think those last three lines really resonate with what Ross Perry was saying is in his opening keynote that this development that we're going through is targeted at community and to engage diverse people. I'd like to now show you three examples of SMK Open being reused inside and outside the museum to give you a more hands-on feel of what I'm talking about here. The first one is um, multi-annual collaboration between Dan the Danish Wikipedia chapter and Danish cultural heritage institutions, where we have monthly community meetups to try and learn from each other how we can bring open collections of cultural heritage onto the open encyclopedia that has millions of users every day. This is a great place for cultural heritage institutions to be present with our knowledge, our images that come from trusting resources, trustworthy resources. Just to run through quickly, to give you a sense of the community vibe here, we meet in the different cultural heritage institutions that host the meetings from month to month. Um, there's always plenty of coffee and sweets, and we try to show people a good time and make it very friendly. Of course, in the past year, we have had to convert the meetings to an online environment, but in fact, that has only grown the community because now people from all over Denmark can take part in the meetings. And the impact of being um, accessible on Wikipedia is huge. So just for SNK's collection, we have more than 37 million page views a year on Wikipedia. The second example I'd like to give you is uh, completely different. It's a jewelry design contest uh, in collaboration with the platform Shapeways, which is a community for uh, people who like to create models in 3D and scan them. Um, we did a partnership with Shapeways uh, to encourage their jewelry design community to be inspired by open collections at the UK and design jewelry. And we had hundreds of entries from designers all over the world producing these beautiful virtual models. And the winners would have their 
models 3D printed at put for sale at the museum and on Shapeways platform. The winning piece was inspired by this painting by Lucas Karnak the Elder from 1532. And it was this 3D printed necklace printed in one piece in a um, uh, fabric called Strong and Flexible that really took the composition of the painting and turned it into a new composition of how to uh, close the necklace and open the necklace. Very, very elegant. What we did was then to create a small exhibition of the winning pieces uh, in the foyer of the museum. Um, and you could buy the pieces, um, which many people did, and have uh, the winning designers invited up to, uh, they come from Milan actually, and we invited them to come and do an art talk at the launch with our director about different interpretation models of, um, of classical painting, being an art historian, being a designer, uh, which attracted uh, an interested audience. The third example is um, our wonderful program for young creatives called Young People's Art Labs, um, where we have our art pilots who are volunteer young people who want to uh, work with community building uh, with bases in the museum's art collections. They do many different uh, projects over the years. One of them was to do a huge remix, 70 meter long remix of artworks in the SMK collection to decorate a construction site when the Copenhagen Metro was being uh, expanded. Um, and they did it in collaboration with the local um, people uh, living next to the construction site. They were frankly not very happy to have this mm, massive construction that was noisy and dirty going on right under their windows. But once they had an opportunity to choose artworks from the collection and play with them and create something beautiful to look at, it really uh, helped improve the experience of living next to uh, the metro construction site. Another example, which I also thought about when Ross Perry was making his talk about reaching diverse audiences, that's really something that the art pilots excel in. They did a collaborative project with drug users in central Copenhagen a couple of years back. Um, again, it was about um, going into um, a local place, um, the injection room um, where the drug users go to inject their drugs in a safe place. Um, it's a very clinical, sterile place uh, under normal circumstances. But the art pilots sat down with the users and created remixes of uh, artworks to put up like wallpaper in these sterile surroundings. and. Um, the users infused these wallpapers with their own stories and dreams um, so that it became all of a sudden a personal space. And these are people who would normally probably never visit the museum, but through this open uh, nest of our collection and through a collaborative approach, um, they were able to use um, their cultural heritage in a way that was meaningful for them. The Young People's uh, Art Labs also went to um, a democracy meeting in 2018 um, called Young People's Meeting. Um, it takes place every year in Copenhagen. And uh, here they, um, they arranged a, what they called a taboo workshop to make the invisible visible. And the invisible here are the taboos that young people carry around um, about their uh, difficult, hard to talk about emotions and problems. The art pilots did this um, workshop together with NGOs uh, that help young people overcome difficulties uh, uh, connected with, for instance, eating disorders or being uh, 
uh, struck with cancer at an, a young age and uh, many other different things that young people can suffer from. There were more than 100 participants, um, school kids, uh, high school um, students, um, who heard testimonies from other young people who have tabooized feelings because they suffer from uh, these disorders, um, physically or mentally. And the workshop was then about going together in groups and then playing with printed artworks from the SMK collection, really just cutting and ripping and creating a collage together that would put images on those difficult emotions that are so hard to talk about and therefore become taboo. We had some feedback from the participants that I'd like to share with you. One of them said, it's easier for me to express my emotions through images or drawings, because then I don't have to explain everything. And then other people can make their own sense of it and relate to it in their own way. Some of the other participants said, it's like art changes character when you can touch it with your own hands. You're able to look at it up close. It means a lot to be able to hold the art between your hands and touch it. So this was what I was talking about in my introduction. That we want to make the art collection feel close to people, something that's part of their own everyday life. Now, coming to the part of my talk that's about the impact that we potentially can have with this new kind of open, um, generous, um, confident, and, and also um, trusting way of working with our collections, trusting our users. For this uh, particular project that we did at the um, the young people's meeting in 2018, we did an impact case study um, using uh, a tool set developed by Europeana, the network for Europe's cultural heritage sector. And you can find the case study at this address, and I'll happily share my slides with you so you can find all the links afterwards. Europeana has a whole section of the a community website centered around impact assessment. You can easily grab a copy of um, the this like impact playbook, which is uh, presenting all the tools for impact assessment. It's easy to use, very well explained. Um, and the whole idea around, it's also in a printed version. I don't think there are any copies left out there, but um, you can just download it. Uh, for free online. The whole idea behind the Impact Playbook is to help the sector because we believe that the cultural heritage sector can increase the change it brings about in people's lives by learning how to manage its impact. This requires that we develop a common language to talk about impact, about how we express our critical contribution to society. I think a lot of us feel in our hearts that we do contribute to a better society through our museums and all of our educational activities and all of our community building. But it can be hard to really put down in a, in a formula. How, how did this contribute? What changed? What difference did it make? And this is what the Impact Playbook helps us do. So in here, you'll find all kinds of resources that are just ready to download and open and use. There are also webinars introducing uh, all the different phases of impact and at the assessment from designing uh, to getting hold of the data to narrating your impact story, et cetera. Um, and there are case studies and communities that you can be part of. I warmly recommend it. Um, just very quickly to run through uh, some of these tools. A core idea here is that museums don't only 
contribute to the things that we normally think about, such as education or uh, enlightenment, but also to the economy of the society. Of uh, We contribute to a more social cohesion. We contribute to innovation. We also have different lenses we can look through when we want to understand what kind of impact are we having with this particular project. So these can also range from utility to learning to community. Another tool that's very uh, handy to have is the empathy map, where you can try to map your users' um, relation with you and the thing you want them to engage in. So this is coming very much back also to what Ross was talking about, that we need to have, empathize with our users and understand their needs. This is all laid out in the playbook. And then there's the change pathway. This is a really efficient tool to help you balance your resources and uh, your activities with the kind of impact you'd like to have. There's an accountability line here because there's so much we can do that's within our control when we run a project. But we can also hope to contribute to a bigger impact in society. For instance, um, more diverse, um, a, a more diverse cultural audience. Um, but um, many other factors will also contribute to that. So that's an important line to think about. You can use this to measure your impact uh, of a specific project. You can also use it to plan for impact, starting to formulate. We would like to contribute to a more socially cohesive society. What kind of outcomes and outputs and activities do we then need to invest in? Just to broaden the horizon here, there are many different impact um, frameworks being developed right now. Another one is MOI, Museums of Impact, developed by the Finnish uh, Heritage Agency. Um, and yet another one is called Indices, um, which is uh, also developed in a, a collaboration between European stakeholders. You can go and check these out. It's really a movement that is trying to empower our sector to become more confident in how we are part of building the society we all would like to live in. So this has only become uh, even more um, uh, relevant now that we've been in COVID-19 mode for uh, more than a year. Um, and I thought back, just to conclude my presentation here, I thought back today at Nina Simon's um, blog post, which is about a year old now, where she reflected on the relevance or the potential impact of um, of what museums, how museums were responding to COVID-19. She says here, without my asking, my inbox is overflowing with virtual museum tours, digital educational resources, etc. This makes me wonder, is this the most meaningful way cultural organizations can contribute? Are we doing this based on some kind of expressed community need? Are we doing it with an eye towards serving communities that are struggling most? And then she ends by saying, we're a creative sector. I think we could get, get more creative. We have to deliver true community value. And I was just reminded of this um, for my talk today because um, I think it's such an important point she's making. And this is that um, we need to start with our users' needs. What are they expressing? What are they looking for? And then try to support that through our digital museum practices. What we have learned during uh, a year of COVID-19 at SMK is that the investment in digitization and, and openness suddenly did acquire new value. So we were able to build a whole a buffet of offerings to uh, the people we couldn't let in through our doors so that they could visit SMK from their own living room. Lots of content, including not only virtual guided tours, videos, and podcasts, 
but also crowdsourcing activities and community meetups. And we've seen a great demand from classrooms, for instance, to access uh, educational content, um, people knowing about these artworks, telling about them, um, just opening up the museum that's closed but also from people in quarantine that are hungry for art and community because they can't go out and they can't meet each other and share their interests. And one of the formats we created for that is a community meetup uh, where people from all over the country can go into a regular Zoom call and meet other people in a discussion around one artwork facilitated by um, uh, one of the really skilled museum educators. And we've had such wonderful feedback from participants here. Enriching, time just flew by, you want to continue the conversation. I feel in a warmth. I really feel like experiencing the artworks in real life now. It's amazing that you can zoom in and see the brush strokes and details. It's a gift to be able to sit in front of your screen and have an art experience. And one of the last ones is, as I was here in my own home, there was peace and quiet for my own thoughts while being challenged by hearing what other people thought and felt about the artwork. So it is possible to build community and to have art experiences through screens. I'm not saying it's optimal, but it's been a way to keep being a community-centered museum throughout this crisis. So to end this, as you can see, there are plenty of new impact cases to explore and learn from. And now I'd like to hear if there are any questions from you and something that you'd like me to expand upon. I'm really curious to hear what you thought. And I will just go out and end my presentations so mm -hmm. that we can see each other again. Well, I can see you. <laughs> yeah, I to humanize the, that experience and to have the chat. Thank you, Merete. Thank you very much. It's uh, inspiring. Uh, those examples that you explained from your museum really is something it needs still to be improved. Um, the, to to have those ideas to try to test it uh, at our own museums with our people and see what it, what it, what it is what. And uh, for example, uh, I really admire this capacity in Denmark, you have to uh, make community building also uh, to work uh, with young people, um, like with NGOs, etc. I think in uh, we have a lot of things to learn from that experiences. And of course, uh, museums collections are a potential to, to be used with those collectivities to work, to test, to do all the other different things. Um, also, Nina Simon uh, talked about it and uh, your museum is a very, very good example here uh, to, to how to increase the interest in, within those objects. Uh, let's start with the questions uh, from some people. Um, I wanted to question, to ask you also, um, I, I heard your talk before uh, in a past uh, conference, and you talk uh, how collections could inspire, uh, for example, uh, TV serials like Netflix, whatever, so we can use those objects to inspire in uh, TV broadcasts, whatever. What do you think about it? <laughs> well, um, <laughs> the thing is, um, at the heart of um, of the open movement in uh, museums, libraries, and archives is the recognition of the public domain. And um, actually, earlier this week, I was um, uh, hosting my own conference, Sharing is Caring, the 10-year anniversary. And one of the keynotes there was uh, Peter Kaufman. Um, he's an American scholar. Mm -hmm. And he said that uh, we have to recognize that there's almost kind of a physics of um, the copyright system where um, cultural objects, due to gravity, fall into the public domain Mm -hmm. after a certain amount of years. 
And when we think about what our collections can be used for, there's, there are no limits because once they fall into the public domain, they are public and everyone is entitled to do something with uh, our common cultural heritage. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for instance, at SMK, we experienced all of a sudden that artworks from our collection popped up in a Netflix TV series. Mm -hmm. um, nobody had asked us permission because the artworks were out there and free to use. Mm -hmm. um, so it was completely okay. We also felt that it was it would be fun to tell, uh, you know, the the audience of this TV series. It's called Alias Grace. It's, it's based on a, a novel by mm -hmm. Margaret Atwood. She's mm -hmm. quite popular. We wanted people to know where do these artwork come from. Mm -hmm. So we wrote an, a Wikipedia article mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Wikipedia article about the TV series, <laughs> we added um, a chapter about mm -hmm. the artworks. So yeah. if you're interested mm -hmm. in this TV series, you're mm -hmm. likely to look it up on Wikipedia and we tell you what artworks you're looking at with links yeah. back to our collection. Yeah, it's a very interesting experience and how museums can take part on this and, and maybe incitate or negotiate with those uh, productors and try to collaborate in the, those projects within the script or whatever. Okay, questions. Um, There's one question that asks, uh, how can they learn more about the work with young people and civic participation? That uh, is there a website, a part on your museum website or whatever that they can take? more information on those um, experiences or where? <laughs> uh, you can look uh, the the uh, art pilots up on our website, um, but there are also some um, uh, papers um, published about the Young People's Art Lab. Um, mm -hmm. I can try to look those up for you um, and, uh, and share them in the chat. Okay. Yes, please. And another question. What do you think about the uh, create exhibition? A very interesting question. Uh, mixing on archive or museum objects, also in a digital way, with objects chosen and brought by the audience. What do yeah. you think? Is that possible to mix? Uh... I think it's a really powerful concept because in that way you bridge the gap that some people feel between their own life, their own existence, and what museums or archives have to offer, mm -hmm. um, because they can bring their own histories into, um, you know, the the catalog, the collection. Um, so I think uh, if you're able to do something where you invite people to bring their own personal cultural heritage into the game. Mm -hmm. um, it's a it's a wonderful way to tell people that um, we're all part of creating cultural heritage. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, there's one more question uh, about Concharda, uh, which is on the audience. She says, uh, many of us believe in the power of open, but there is no museum yet in Spain that has adopted a wide open policy and hints how to influence on an open land mindset. Do you have any in? Well, um, I would say the thing that has really worked for many countries, because it's been kind of a snowball effect. Um, mm. Holland was an early adopter, England, the US, then some other countries started becoming really interested. And, and what we did, for instance, in Denmark, was to invite some of the people that had led the processes in other countries to come and talk to directors. Mm -hmm. So for instance, at SMK, we've had uh, Michael Edson, who um, worked at the Smithsonian in Washington. We've mm -hmm. had Lizzie Jongma, who worked at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. We invited them to come and tell our directors, what's in it for you? <laughs> And that was a really powerful way to do it. And a very, you know, if you are able to do that, otherwise also, you know, conferences and networking, 
um, getting the good sort of cases. Uh, and that's yeah. what your piano is all about, for instance, um, creating a platform mm -hmm. where where professionals from our sector can can get together and share, you mm -hmm. know, tips and hits but also share case studies. So go look for the for the impact case studies and see if there's something that you can use uh, as a good argument in the process. Convincing, yes, uh, of course. There's lots of potential and it's transformative uh, for the directors and the leaders to change their minds and start sharing and caring. Um, one more question, Isabel is saying, what I think is the one of the last, let's see, uh, what tools do you use in order to measure the impact of your uh, actions? Are they, uh, are they long-term projects or small projects? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I, I just briefly ran through some of these tools from the Europeana Impact Framework. And I think especially that the change pathway is a very powerful tool to get an overview of where you want to go with a project and what you need to then um, put in in terms of resources and uh, which stakeholders you need to get lined up and hmm. uh, what outputs you, you have to produce, etc., to reach the impact you're looking for. Um, hmm. So, and, and you can use the change pathway both for like tiny projects and for multi-annual projects. Um, it's all very well described um, in uh, on the Europeana website. Um, so I really recommend that you go read further there. Um, for me, um, the change pathway has become sort of part of my it's become internalized in my thinking by now. I always think in these uh, like structures. And um, I think that's the, that's the great thing about the Europeana tools that um, they're so easy to use that uh, you can actually learn to use them without even consulting like manual. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the key issue also is uh, the openness of the collections on the rights and uh, change the way that we look at the properties and, and objects and all that. So, uh, okay, uh, one more question and it's uh, very linked to the last one uh, is, uh, do you evaluate in some, how, uh, in some way how the digital audience use the digital resources? How do you evaluate that? Um, like yeah, we try to um, uh, to keep um, a, a combination in our evaluation of projects uh, between uh, you know monitoring uh, the the quantitative numbers, how many people download and reuse and watch and uh, etc. Mm -hmm. And we've seen really great numbers, I have to say, during COVID nineteen lockdowns. Um, mm -hmm. It's a it's a sad context, but it's been uh, it's been proving the value of of access to uh, culture mm -hmm. digitally, mm -hmm. um, and then we combine that with um, with user surveys, like uh, just the the small uh, quotes I shown you from um, mm -hmm. this community that was taking place during the lockdown, where you could meet with other people and talk about an artwork. Mm -hmm. um, so we try to combine the number of people who participate with the kind of um, uh, statements or experiences or impressions that they share. Mm -hmm. And we can do that through interviews or through surveys, etc. But that combination of quantitative and qualitative is also at the heart of the Europeana toolset for impact assessment. And I think it's, hmm. it's somewhere in between um, the, the hard and the soft kind of, uh, of feedback that uh, we can see that we're um, contributing to a, a positive impact. Mm -hmm. Yes, qualitatively and quantitatively uh, to get those data and make decisions for the future. Uh, I'm afraid we need to stop because now it's supposed to start the round table. 
So I, we have to say goodbye, Merete. It's really a pleasure to have you here inspiring those collections. And I hope the Spanish museums, can, we can follow uh, this example and in, in involucrate all audiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.